tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Just like alone and dying and nobody knows and no one cares. The body of a newborn baby found inside a portable toilet on Vancouver's downtown east side. Also, there is an ongoing investigation that is uh, happening as of uh, yesterday when the first case was identified. As the COVID-19 death toll in BC rises, another outbreak at a Metro Vancouver poultry plant. And... How the deadly massacre in Nova Scotia ended. Is there also a structure fire at this site? And why it's being called an almost unbelievable fluke. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening, and we begin tonight on Vancouver's downtown east side, where a newborn baby has been found dead inside a portable washroom. My police are now searching for the infant's mother, but as John Hernandez reports, the death has left the community there in mourning. The tragedy still too much for people in this community to bear. It's just exactly the image of so many people in this neighborhood. Just like people that are left like trash and garbage when they're really just people. And that baby is like a metaphor for everybody here. Police were called to this portable washroom at Main and Hastings just before 6 p.m. last night. Inside, a dead newborn. The mother, nowhere to be found. None of us can imagine what she is going through and where she's at. And we are very concerned for her, her physical well-being and her mental well-being. It's not clear if the baby was weeks, hours, or even days old. Today, morning, and an attempt to heal. We brought tobacco and sage and our Eagle fans, and we shared drum songs so they can have a safe and journey back to the ancestors. But still, a heavy blow to a community already on the brink. Oh, I cried. I cried. It's devastating that the woman had no resources anywhere else to go but this bathroom out here. Since the pandemic began, a swath of public health resources in the area have dried up. Bathrooms have closed, showers have closed, uh, and so the ability for people to take care of their health and sanitation needs is really challenging right now. Mebret Bayane has been trying to raise funding for safe washrooms, spaces that will be staffed with support workers to help women in need. Right now, our barrier is that we cannot pay to rent the bathroom trailers or pay the staff. I mean, we need help, right? It's an easy solution. It's a service the city of Vancouver says it's looking to implement in light of the tragedy. We, uh, as a city, as a province, failed this mother. Um, in not uh, supporting her uh, and not providing more choices. Um, and, uh, and that's what I want us to be talking about and, and thinking about going forward. But for now, the search for the mother continues. The VPD is hoping to get her medically assessed. They're asking anyone who might know where she is to come forward so she can get the help she needs. John Hernandez, CBC News, Vancouver. Four more people have died from COVID-19 in our province, bringing the total to 94. And there are 29 new cases being reported today. We're also learning of an outbreak at another poultry processing plant in the Lower Mainland. Tanya Fletcher is here live now. Tanya, are these cases today now connected to the other poultry plant? Yes, it appears so, Anita. The new outbreak is in Coquitlam at the Superior Poultry Plant, and that's where we now have two confirmed cases and an investigation happening. It's a sister company to the Vancouver facility that now has more than two dozen workers who tested positive for the virus. A provincial health officer, Dr. Bonnie Henry, says it appears the transmission may have stemmed from staff moving between sites. She says the two locations are under different management structure, but it's likely there were others at this new location who are also ill, and we'll likely hear about those cases in the coming days. I mean, while there's been another outbreak at a long-term care home, this one is in Kelowna, and there are two new clusters in acute care units at both Ridge Meadows Hospital and Lionsgate Hospital. And in regards to how these outbreaks might affect the move towards gradually loosening measures. Henry says we need to be able to contain these kinds of outbreaks and reach a manageable number of new cases. So we asked, is there a magic number? They're using a sort of a measuring stick to lift restrictions? Well, not quite. 
obviously I would like it to be zero for a number of days. Um, that is the aim, the goal, and ideally zero for many weeks. Um, but I do recognize that we have a little bit of room to play Plays probably not the right room. We have a little bit of room to ease within that if we are able to do it safely. And so she went on to say things like making sure businesses have proper precautions, maintaining those physical distancing measures, and not increasing our connections dramatically. Okay, Tanya, Dr. Bonnie Henry also talked about expanding our personal circles. What might that look like when it is time? Yeah, she says we'll be talking about that more in the coming days, but we need to start thinking about widening our social circles in the coming weeks. And so she emphasized how important it's been to only have connections within our own households at this point and to minimize connections with others until now. So as we look to expand those social circles, the key will be to discern and manage who might be most at risk in our personal lives. So if I am going back to work, perhaps I need to be careful about who my children are going to go on a play date with. It may be more important that they spend time with their grandparents, that their grandparents are able to care for them when I'm going back to work. And it would mean not having that play date because then you're exposing your child to the connections of those connections. So she cautions again, we have to be uh, very careful and do that in a very safe way because we're still extremely limited with the parameters we have to operate within and we're not there yet. She says a misstep in the wrong direction puts us all at risk because we've seen how quickly this virus can take hold and trigger transmissions. And she did reiterate though, all of this is not forever. It's for now, but now maybe months or even as long as a year. There is light though at the end of it. Anita Mike. Thanks, Tanya. Of course, beyond the numbers in this outbreak, there are people. Margaret Shea was a mother and grandmother who loved golf almost as much as she loved her family. As Jesse Johnston reports tonight, COVID-19 took her life at the age of 82. Margaret Shea's glasses were so stylish she always had great glasses. <laughs> that her daughter, Karen, still has them. And her laugh? You'd always notice it in, the, in, a, in a room full of people, and she was laughing, you would always know, that's my mom. So unique and boisterous, her brother Michael can almost hear it, rising from the old photos on Karen's kitchen table, thousands of kilometers away. She had uh, a laugh that sounded like a waterfall um, that sort of cascaded. The life of any party, a mother of three who built a successful career after her children grew up, oh, her team won the gold medal. And she'd wiped the floor with any man who dared to get on the golf course with her, including her husband, Bill. My brothers and I kind of joke about how we're golf orphans. Every Thanksgiving weekend, we, we wouldn't be having the turkey. We, we would actually be having pizza because my parents were at a golf tournament all weekend. Later on, as dementia stole more and more of Margaret's mind, her family moved her to Lynn Valley Care Center in North Vancouver. They say her care was excellent, but the facility was hit last month with one of the worst COVID-19 outbreaks in BC. I'm out here in Toronto, my brother's in Montreal. Um, my sister was getting over a severe cold, so no one could go in. They talk about them being kept safe, but in a way they're being sacrificed because they're keeping them safe by isolation. Contact with her family was limited to video chats because of travel and visitor restrictions. In her state of mind, she didn't understand. Mm -hmm. So I, I knew, like, that just makes me sad to think about her last month of life and how she wondered where we were. When Margaret became incredibly sick, Karen got to visit in full protective gear. Margaret died two days later. If anything good comes out of all of this, that, you know, we sort of rethink how we care for our seniors. If a pandemic does happen again, that we're better prepared for it. The family will have a celebration of life whenever travel restrictions ease. Until then, they have pictures and memories of a woman whose laugh sounded like a cascading waterfall. Jesse Johnston, CBC News, Bowen Island. A suspect seen in a video of what police are calling a racially motivated attack has now been identified by investigators. Our Leon Young is back at the scene where a 92-year-old man was shoved to the ground in East Vancouver. Leon is live now. Leon, you've spoken to the victim's family. How are they doing today? 
Well, Anita, the family is feeling grateful for all of the support thus far. I spoke with one of the victim's granddaughters. She's based in Calgary, and she says that her 92-year-old grandfather has severe dementia, and he doesn't really remember what happened at all that day, but he was quite shaken up when the family did find him. He had actually wandered away from the family home. That's how he ended up here at the 7-Eleven and staff here were trying to help him and he only speaks Chinese so he doesn't probably know anything that the suspect was saying to him as he was being dragged out of the 7-Eleven and, and thrown onto the ground. She says that her grandfather is a very gentle man, has very passive behavior so she can't imagine what would have triggered the suspect's actions but they are feeling grateful for the support thus far. Vancouver police today also responded to the outpouring of tips. Vancouver Police would like to thank the public so much for their um, outgoing support and during this, this time we're, we're overwhelmed with all the information we got and, and we're very grateful. So in less than 24 hours, they've been able to identify a suspect. But what we don't know is that if that's the same person that we've seen in that surveillance video, there is nobody in custody at this point, but investigators will be following up with the suspect that they have identified. Now, Leanne, this video has elicited a huge response from the public, people talking about it all over social media. How is the community reacting? Well, many people are appalled and shocked. You know, that video was very violent, but many people say they're also not surprised that they've seen it happen. We've seen incidents out east in Toronto, in L.A., in New York, more of them in the U.S. I mean, they've got a higher population overall. But to hear they are not surprised that it's happened. However, it's creating a sense of dread and apprehension for many Asian Canadians when they are going out. I spoke with a, a B.C. author, Fiona Tinway Lam. Uh, she has uh, expressed a, that that similar sentiment and she actually went out recently and had a run-in and it's a good example of how many people are feeling take a listen to what she has to say and I was cycling one day just along uh, 8th Avenue and this guy yelled at me where's your mask and I realized it didn't matter whether I was wearing a mask or not wearing a mask I was still going to be targeted just the same so this is more unsettling behavior that we've seen. And what she's hoping and many others are hoping is that people will stand up against this behavior, not just those of us in the Asian Canadian community, but everybody. And I'm sure that's a sentiment that the victim's family would agree with. Anita, Mike? Leanne Young reporting live tonight in East Vancouver. Thanks, Leanne. Well, just days after announcing the suspension of dozens of bus routes across Metro Vancouver, TransLink is warning more cuts might be needed. TransLink outlined its projections to the mayor's council this morning, forecasting between a $660 and $885 million revenue impact next year if there isn't a quick cure to the virus. That's because even if a vaccine is developed, it'll take a while before everyone feels comfortable in mass transit areas again. They've already reduced SkyTrain and CBUS service and are suspending more than 80 bus routes. But Vice President Jeff Cross says more cuts might be coming. Yeah we must continue to explore uh, deeper service cut options uh, if financial aid is not forthcoming and if the pandemic changes it, the nature of what the demand is on the system. As for longer term projects like the Expo Line extension to Fleetwood and Millennium Line extension to Arbutus, well, TransLink says a lot depends on how long the pandemic lasts and where higher levels of government choose to put stimulus dollars when it all ends. And on top of that, now Unifor will use the BC Labor Code to challenge TransLink subsidiary Coast Mountain Bus Company's last round of layoff notices issued on Monday. Applications for BC's emergency benefit for workers whose jobs have been affected by COVID-19 will open up on May 1st. The benefit is a one-time tax-free payment of $1,000. The provincial government says most people who are eligible for the federal aid program CERB will be eligible for this grant as well. The only stipulations are that applicants must also have filed or have agreed to file a 2019 BC tax return and they cannot be receiving provincial income assistance or disability assistance. And later in this newscast, we're gonna be joined by NDP MLA Spencer Chandra Herbert. He's the chair of BC's Rental Task Force and he'll be taking your questions about the impact of COVID-19 on renters and landlords in our province. 
You can give us a call now, 604-662-6801. We're also taking questions via email at cbcnewsvancouver at cbc.ca. And if you're watching online tonight, you can always post your questions in the comment section. Well, Muslims around the world are preparing to mark the start of the holy month of Ramadan. It begins with the sighting of the new moon. But with community events canceled and orders to stay home, the COVID pandemic means this will be a Ramadan like no other. As Val Puri of the CBC Impact Team reports, families here are getting ready to adjust accordingly. Sweet Cream invites George to the mosque. They gather to do a good deed. Together, they make food baskets to share with others in need. The storybook lesson of Ramadan is the same, but how this young family marks the annual Muslim holy month this year will be very different. I think we're going to really miss um, having bigger dinner parties um, to celebrate the end of fast. Uh, we'll miss our congregational prayer. Mohammed Jinnah's family will stay away from his aging parents in a bid to shield them from COVID. But the virus, he says, has brought many principles of Ramadan into focus. The lockdown has now shown us that in reality, although we, we act like we're different, we're all in this together. Some of the things that we take for granted, I've now realized over the last month, are not to be taken for granted, but to be taken as granted to us. Allah. Muslims who observe Ramadan go without food and drink from sunrise to sunset every day. Allah. Then get together to break their fast, Allah. eat and pray together. It's difficult to not come together. It's the first time I've had to pray alone and not be side by side with members of our community. The unique thing is that this pandemic is actually giving Muslims an opportunity to now practice that self-discipline and that realization of sacrifice. Virtual dinners and Quran readings are being offered as an alternative to large gatherings. I like to say that more mosques have risen in the community in the sense that many people have kind of made a mosque in their homes. Online viewership of prayers has increased considerably in recent weeks. The Muslim community has already seen sweeping changes as physical distancing rules have come into effect. Congregational prayers and other events have been cancelled at the mosque. And the community aspect of Ramadan this year will be very challenging. With its stay-at-home orders, the COVID-19 pandemic is forcing changes to some customs and making others like fasting more challenging. Irene is going to try fasting a day without food or drink. George is curious, can Kareem do it? I'm going to be at home all the time, and with the fridge so close to proximity, the distractions are going to be much more difficult to manage. By the time Ramadan ends in four weeks, it's hoped some COVID restrictions will be loosened and the celebration of Eid will be a more familiar event. Bell Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Let's check in now with meteorologist Brett Soderholm. Our first look at the forecast. Brett, we have uh, we can't see it, but we've erected a rather large tent uh, over the outdoor set here uh, at home, uh, but we haven't, uh, we haven't needed it. Well, it's very fortunate, but it's a good idea to probably keep that going for at least the next couple of days, <laughs> because this morning, I mean, it did start off a little bit showery, but for right now, I think definitely sunshine is the main story. And you can see behind me, it is looking pretty nice and sunny right now in downtown Vancouver. But I do want to show you on the radar, we are still dealing with some spotty showers in our region. So that's specifically going to be out toward Abbotsford and Chilliwack. Just a few spotty showers there, really not that much. And even the clouds themselves across the region have really eased up. So we're getting quite a few of those sunny breaks. Now, yesterday, I'd mentioned how we were talking about we have been in such a deficit of rain. And if we include the amount that fell throughout yesterday, we're still only at about 12 millimeters. And this is, of course, taken at YVR. Now, unofficially today, we got about another four millimeters. So we're still a far cry away from where we should be at this time of year. Temperatures, though, this is where we should be. We're looking at seasonal highs right now, anywhere between 13 and 15 degrees. And that's exactly where we are. And when it comes to just a quick little look ahead for our forecast in the region for the next little while expect a mostly dry night tonight tomorrow there's going to be a risk for some showers first thing in the morning and then largely a cloudy day and then by the end of tomorrow into the weekend we got some more rain ahead and i'll have all that when i come back all right we'll talk to you soon brett well, just over a week since the Vancouver Aquarium went public with its need for $1 million to sustain animal care, the association says it has raised more than $600,000 so far. 
Since closing its doors to the public March 17th over COVID-19, the aquarium says it has lost almost all revenue and has had to lay off 60% of its staff. It says even after extensive cost cutting, expenses for animal care and keeping the water circulating adds up to more than one million a month. The association says it is thankful for the help it has received from around the world. The fact that so many people has been reaching out from 31 countries uh, around the world, far away as far away as from Finland and the Philippines, that's that's awesome. That's that's every dollar is a love letter. That's how it feels. Vancouver Aquarium does not receive monthly or annual money from the government. And just a quick reminder, you can watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. The free app is also where you can find other CBC programs. And of course, CBC Vancouver is also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Well, new revelations from the weekend massacre in Nova Scotia. Coming up, how it all ended in what some are calling an almost unbelievable fluke. Stay with us. And thanks for being with us online tonight for more news during the television commercial break. Well, though pandemic restrictions may gradually be eased, health experts agree a full return to the sort of lives we led this time last year hinges on effective testing and a vaccine. Well, today, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau announced a major investment in Canadian work on those initiatives. We're putting in place an additional $1.1 billion for a national medical and research strategy to address COVID-19. This plan has three pillars, research on vaccines and other treatments, supports for clinical trials, and expanding national testing and modeling. A key objective will be to ensure the ability to mass produce a vaccine here at home so as to bypass what will likely be fierce global demand. In the short term, controlling the spread means blood and antibody tests and getting a grip on how long immunity lasts. A new COVID-19 immunity task force will be led by a group of experts, including Dr. David Naylor, who provided expertise with SARS back in 2003. It's aiming to test at least 1 million Canadians over two years. And in the meantime, keep on washing those hands. However, you might find that if you do so often enough, cracks will form. Oh, my hands are starting to get rough. <laughs> Those cracks in your clean, dry hands could be COVID-19 traps, though. After weeks of intense hand washing and hand sanitizer, here is what you can do about it. And the hands are the only place on the body where there's no real significant oil gland density, unlike, say, the face. And so the more you wash your hands in an understandable attempt to get rid of the, uh, the outside world, the bacteria, the viruses, etc., the more you strip away that protective uh, layer of lipid on the skin, and then you can easily get hand eczema as a consequence of vigorous hand washing. The hands are peely, they're red, they're scaly, and they're quite uh, itchy. There's lots of nooks and crannies and cracks uh, in the skin, and bacteria and viruses can lurk within those areas more than they can on intact skin. Your skin is dry, it requires moisture, and so water-based moisturizer is what your skin typically requires. Moisturize as much as you can because that way your hands will be clean and then that way they will be hydrated, they'll feel better, they'll be less itchy, and then you'll be much less likely to be needing a prescription cortisone, for example. In a pinch, if you don't have moisturizer in your home, you can basically use regular water. When your hands are wet, uh, then basically just lock in that water with the Vaseline. Vaseline by itself isn't a moisturizer, but it uh, holds water in so it prevents uh, evaporation of, of water from your skin. In a pinch, there's uh, nothing that rivals hand sanitizers, but they're quite irritating because of, of all the alcohols within them. Given the choice, I've seen people use uh, regular soap and water as compared to sanitizers. The RCMP in Nova Scotia wasn't talking today, 
But new details are emerging about last weekend's deadly killing spree. As Kayla Hounsell reports tonight, one of the survivors turned out to be the gunman's girlfriend. It was here in the port pic area that the shooter made his first stop in a deadly path of destruction. Now, CBC News has learned it was also here that police encountered a woman with whom the killer had been in a long-term relationship. She had been forcibly restrained, but survived. It's unclear whether she was injured or to what extent, just one part of a rapidly moving chaotic scene. Do we want to uh, cut the ceiling? No, not for sure. It's in quite a ways, the actual house. They're bringing the victims out to that intersection from the actual scene. But no, they don't know if they've caught him. I don't know. As darkness turned to light, the manhunt persisted for hours. The RCMP are still saying very little about what happened yesterday. I would like nothing more than to provide the media and public with the timeline, but it literally is still a work in progress. And it would be unfair and inappropriate for us to give that out in its current state. We are very close, uh, I would say within a day. But today, the four said nothing at all. Through multiple sources, CBC News has learned more about how the manhunt ended. Roger, we have reports of the suspect down at the Enfield Big Stop. Police have said they shot and killed the suspect here at this gas station Sunday morning. What they aren't saying is that it was only by chance. Police had tweeted Gabriel Wartman was no longer driving a police cruiser, but now a silver SUV. In fact, he had stolen another car from one of his victims, Gina Goulet. It was low on gas. And then, a remarkable coincidence. When he pulled up to the Irving Big Stop, the emergency response team and a canine unit officer were already there, also filling up in an unmarked vehicle. Sources say it was one of these officers who shot the gunman. Yesterday, police said they're holding back the timeline because there are still gaps in it. They said any mistakes could impact both their investigation and the victim's families. Kayla Hounsel, CBC News, Halifax. So what about that elusive timeline? Once again, we've done our own digging to fill in some of the pieces. Thomas Dagla takes us back to the start of that rampage. Sunset in rural Nova Scotia usually signals a quiet night ahead, but not this time. We're seeing huge flames of smoke from where we are. Soon, more buildings went up in flames. Shots were heard all around, but how many were dead, it was far too early to tell. That's what they're saying. They do have another victim uh, possibly on the scene. The RCMP are requesting uh, more ambulances, probably uh, one more coming and then uh, at least one more standby. At 11.32 p.m. on Twitter only, a first warning from police in Portapic to avoid the area. Stay in your homes with the doors locked. Then for a full eight and a half hours, there would be no update until the RCMP warned on Sunday morning of an active shooter situation. By then, police knew they were hunting for someone dressed just like them, driving a car just like theirs. But they kept that to themselves for more than an hour, tweeting only the suspect's name and picture at first. Those details came in their totality to us early in the morning of Sunday uh, after a key witness was located and interviewed. Perhaps lost in the scramble a tip months earlier that Gabriel Wortman had a fully mocked up RCMP cruiser. The gunman's former employer telling us Wortman showed him a picture of the car last year and that police had said to keep it on a trailer and off the road. I mean, this was something that was professionally done. Um, and what questions were asked as to uh, why he was doing this? Did he hold himself out as a police officer when he had this done? Even Sunday morning, it wasn't until 10:17 that police warned Nova Scotians the killer may be impersonating an officer, a potent disguise amid a chaotic response. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. Coming up after the break, one-on-one -on -one with NDP MLA and the chair of the Rental Task Force in BC, Spencer Chandra Herbert. Are you a renter or a landlord? He's taking your questions. Call us 604-662-6801. Send us an email or reach out in the live chat on our streams online.
Well, thanks for staying with us online during this second uh, TV commercial break. Well, numbers are, of course, a big part of the COVID-19 pandemic, most of them very grim. But in New Zealand, they are a cause for cautious optimism over a strategy that appears to be working. In a population of about 5 million, some 1,400 people have caught the virus. 14 have died. As Chris Brown explains early and strict measures are credited with reducing the impact of the virus there. I'm that psyched up. <laughs> Surf's coming soon. I'm getting ready now. Zen Wallace won't have to wait long now to get back in the water. His passion and livelihood, surfing, was banned more than a month ago, criminalized, as he calls it, as part of a sweeping lockdown in New Zealand's battle against COVID-19. His surf school was shuttered and beaches on the North Island were left empty. And while he didn't agree with the ban, perhaps the other strict measures were worth it. Big props to our, our great Prime Minister, you know, she's done an incredible job of making us, you know, keeping us safe and acting early and quick. New Zealand's virus fighting measures rank as among the most strident in the Western world. Most businesses were ordered shut and people were only allowed trips to grocery stores and pharmacies and a little bit of outdoor exercise. But this week, Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern came very close to proclaiming victory over COVID-19. We have done what very few countries have been able to do. We have stopped a wave of devastation. Infectious disease expert Susie Wiles says while New Zealand has the advantage of being an island, using an extreme lockdown to eliminate the coronavirus rather than just slow it down took a lot of political will. It's only a really viable strategy if you do it early enough. Going forward, she says the key will be tracking new infections, locating anyone who comes in contact with a sick person and monitoring the country's borders. We may end up having countries around the world that um, that are these little islands that, you know, we, you could potentially travel between. Singapore serves as a cautionary tale. It too seemed on the verge of eradicating COVID, but then got hit by a terrible second wave. It could be a long way off before we actually get international visitors coming over here. But as of this coming Monday at midnight, New Zealand will start sending kids back to school, permitting businesses to reopen and letting surfers back in the ocean. Chris Brown, CBC News, Vancouver. And here are some of the stories we are following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. I was horrified. I was horrified and um, I just thought about the baby being alone and isolated. The body of a newborn baby has been found inside a portable toilet in Vancouver's downtown east side. Police say they are concerned for the physical and mental well-being of the baby's mother and are looking to speak with her. It's not clear whether the baby was weeks, days, or hours old. This is a sister plant to the United Poultry outbreak that had been announced uh, earlier this week. An outbreak at another poultry processing plant in the Lower Mainland. This one is in Coquitlam at the Superior Poultry Plant where there are two confirmed cases of COVID-19 and an investigation. It appears the transmission may have stemmed from staff moving between sites. All right, joining us now is Spencer Chandra Herbert. He is the NDP MLA for the riding of Vancouver West End, also serves as the chair for BC's Rental Task Force. He's here to answer your questions today. Thanks so much for being here. It's good to be with you. All right, let's get started on the first question. Um, can you tell us how many people in BC are actually asking for help with, with rent or, or landlords? For sure. Uh, we've had over 50,000 applications for the rental supplement so far. 
Uh, now, it was just announced a couple of weeks ago, so we expect there to be more. Uh, if you haven't applied already uh, and you need that support because you've been impacted by COVID-19, uh, I'm certainly urging you to apply now um, and to find a way to get that application in so you can make sure that you get the April amount, the May and the June. So, uh, of course, that's if you're a single, it's $300 a month. If you're a couple, um, uh, with dependents, it would be up to $500 a month, so about $1,500 over that period. Okay, so 50,000 people have applied. How many are receiving checks, or how many checks have been sent out, and how many have been processed and are in the queue? Uh, my understanding is it's about 20,000 or so that are in the queue right now um, in terms of the processing. Uh, the checks that have actually gone out, I think there's over 5,000 so far now. Uh, but they're really um, they're adding more staff because there was a bit of a delay, and I know that people have been waiting, wondering, uh, obviously, as May first uh, approaches, whether or not they're going to be approved. Uh, in some cases, it's because the landlord has not um, agreed, has not authenticated the uh, uh, the application because it's a two-step process. The tenant fills it out. Uh, once it's approved on that step, then it goes to the landlord to say, "Is this person indeed a renter in your home?" Uh, and then the money flows uh, should get to that landlord within seven days once that process is complete. We're hearing stories about um, renters who haven't lost their job but are telling the landlord they can't pay the rent and, and they're saying, you know, they can't evict me at all, so I'm just not going to pay my rent. Landlords are asking, what's the recourse here? What can I do in this case? Yeah, uh, I've heard anecdotes on both sides of both landlords trying to push out the renters now, even though evictions have been banned but also in some cases renters trying to take advantage of this. I think um, it's just a horrible thing to do for people to try and take advantage of each other in this time of pandemic. Uh, there of course are recourse, uh, there is recourse for a landlord uh, through the courts and through the residential tenancy grant once we get through this public health emergency. Um, but it, it's really, I would just appeal to everybody's best nature. Uh, if you can pay your rent, do it. Obviously, I think that's something we just as a society have been doing. Uh, if you are in struggle, um, communicate that. If uh, you as a landlord um, are able to, if you've been profiting for a number of years um, and you're able to support your renter, your tenant, uh, who's been allowing you to do that, uh, do that. Um, you know, I've heard good stories. I think often we focus on the negative, but I've heard really good stories about people stepping up to support each other. Uh, uh, landlords in some cases stepping forward and saying, well, no, we're not going to charge rent during this period or we're charging uh, half the rent um, uh, because that's worked out for the tenant's income. But uh, we have to be better people than we know how to be right now. And so if you're trying to take advantage, don't. Uh, and if you see a way you can help somebody do. Okay, we do have some questions coming in now. A caller wants to know, my household applied for the supplement, but our landlord says he hasn't received it yet. Is there any way tenants can verify when the landlord has received it? Uh, great question. I've raised that with the uh, BC Housing. They're looking into that issue right now because I think the assumption was that once the person was approved and it went to the landlord, the landlord would respond very quickly. I think there has been a bit of a holdup um, in the approval process to get it from when the person applies to the landlord. Um, BC Housing has told me, because I was inquiring, because constituents have raised this with me, uh, that they're adding more staff, uh, they're training more staff uh, to get the, the applications approved as soon as possible. Um, I think folks uh, uh, should know, of course, that evictions have been uh, curtailed right now. So if you've applied, you get approved. Uh, even if uh, you will get the money for April, May, June, as long as you apply in April and were approved. Uh, so just because you haven't heard today, and I know landlords are getting concerned about this as well, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Um, it just means it's going to take a little bit longer. So uh, I'm hoping that they can speed it up because certainly people need that assurance sooner than later. Uh, for, given the for, circumstances. For sure. Uh, Shirley asks, can a tenant withhold rent if the landlord or building managers do not clean the building during the COVID-19 pandemic? Are there any laws written saying the landlord has to keep the building clean? Uh, the laws are clear. A landlord has an obligation to maintain safe premises. Uh, I know certainly we've been telling everybody, you know, here's uh, the basics uh, of, of cleanliness required of cleaning the elevators, uh, the common touch pads and so on much more often. 
I know in some cases there have been challenges to get building owners and others to do that. Um, again, there shouldn't be, but uh, we know there are. Some folks have taken it on themselves to support each other by upping the cleanliness level, and I thank them for it. Uh, but really, building owners um, through the residential tenancy branch, of course, can be forced to make uh, premises safe if they refuse to. Uh, so applications can still come in through the residential tenancy branch um, for emergency action if it is an unsafe premises uh, and the people are refusing to do anything. Um, you know, like elevators, uh, it should be clear that you're not getting four or five people into an elevator. We need to be ensuring we're uh, one person or two if you know each other. Um, those kinds of things need to be communicated by building owners, but also by all of us as a society, because uh, it's not enough to just say, well, somebody else should have done it uh, in a public health emergency. We all have an obligation. Absolutely. Tanya, Rachel is concerned about people falling through the holes, those who don't qualify for some of the government programs but are desperate for help. What do you say to her? Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I would urge you reach out to your member of the legislature, um, reach out to Minister of Finance, Minister of Housing. Uh, if you have examples of people who are falling through the cracks, certainly uh, it's our job as MLAs, if there is a program that should be getting support to people that need it, to find ways to make that happen. And I, I know certainly I'm looking at things like eligibility criteria for the rental supplement, looking at uh, uh, how long. Um, as is the Ministry of Housing, because we want the program to work for people, um, not just, you know, obviously that's why we created it. Um, we don't want to just store up more problems for the future. Uh, let's let's make this work for more people now, because, you know, prevention is a better solution than uh, just letting problems fester. Okay, we have about 30 seconds here before we have to wrap. What is your biggest concern long-term regarding the debt that is piling up for renters and landlords? Uh, I don't want to see a whole lot of folks be evicted right after the COVID pandemic is uh, averted uh, when the public health crisis goes away. That's not something that any government would want. Uh, and I'm most concerned that people are able to have better lives coming out of this, uh, not just prolonged misery and, and uh, pain because of uh, this public health crisis. It's unprecedented. We're figuring it out, feeling it our way through the dark in some cases. Um, but again, we got to do what's best for everybody and raise each other up and not just push problems onto others because of this health emergency. Uh, again, I think it's incumbent on all of us to look out for all of us, right? The and that's what I'm trying to do. The chair of BC's Rental Task Force, Spencer Chandra Herbert, thank you so much for being on the show tonight. Thank you. 6.43 on this Thursday evening, a live shot from Victoria's Swan Hotel tonight. Uh, beautiful evening but you know the saying april showers but just how much rain might be in store brett's going to break down the chances of precip next
Well, what started as a fun idea to honor BC's top health official has snowballed into something much larger. Limited edition Fluvog shoes designed in Dr. Bonnie Henry's honor went on sale today and crashed the website. Here's what the site looked like just after four this afternoon when the shoe company launched the pre-sale. Shoe designer John Fluvog says he partnered with her after people began noticing she was wearing his shoes in her daily briefings. The pink pumps retail for $339 with all pre-sale proceeds going to the food banks of BC. It's a charity chosen by Dr. Bonnery Henry herself. The inside is stamped with her now famous phrase, be kind, be calm, and be safe. The lucky few who were able to buy a pair won't get them until August. Well, that's okay. A little bit of a wait there, but it'll be worth it. And uh, Dr. Henry, I was asked about the shoes uh, at her daily briefing today, and uh, she, she wasn't embarrassed, but she was uh, uh, very flattered and said she's honored to be doing it, and of course, raising all this uh, this money as well, so that's fantastic to see. Absolutely. Okay, uh, oh, actually, let's get we're to just the hearing that they're now. now sold out as well, Mike. Oh, the, <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, that's great. That is fantastic. Uh, Brett, uh, uh, with a, a pretty impressive uh, shoe collection himself, as I'm Does told. He? Is here now with the uh, the forecast. Uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say I've got I've got a good collection of like climbing shoes and hiking boots, but definitely Flip nothing as fashionable too. as those. Um, in any case, <laughs> in any case, yeah. I back to our kind of weather story here. You can still see behind me. It is still really nice and sunny. And if you get the chance to even just look at this for the next little while, I don't want to jinx it, but this is probably going to be about the last of the sunshine for the week. We're going into a much more unsettled pattern here. I'm going to walk you through what you can be expecting over the next couple of days. So it's really going to be beginning kind of overnight into tomorrow morning. We're going to deal with the risk for showers once again, fairly widespread across the south coast, but it's going to be on Saturday where it's really going to pick up in intensity. You can see that dark green color there. This is going to be some of the heaviest rain we'll have seen all month, and that's going to be carrying on likely as showers throughout the weekend. And uh, certainly we're not going to be the only place in the province dealing with this, but I do want to show you a rough estimate of the rainfall totals here across the lower mainland. We're probably comfortably in that 15 to 30 millimeter range. Though some places at a higher elevation are going to be getting even more than that. Now to zoom out a little bit, where is this all coming from? Well, something we haven't seen in a while. These are two strong Pacific systems back to back. You can see kind of that comma shape over toward Haida Gwaii. That's indicative of really strong winds. So basically the whole province of BC going to be in this together. Temperature wise, you're going to notice a change. We're going to be going through a little bit of cooler temperatures over the next couple of days, but still hovering around that seasonal value. But yeah, when you look ahead to our five-day forecast here, a lot more showers in the icon. But as I mentioned a bit earlier, we still are very much in a rain deficit. So I think every bit here is going to be counting. And of course, we should all be staying inside. But if you do need to go out, remember that umbrella. All right. Thanks very much, Brett. Okay, Brett. Thank you very much. Yeah. Well, with uh, COVID-19, uh, our city, of course, looks very, very different. Places that are usually teeming with people are now pretty much empty, all but abandoned. Radio Canada videographer Camille Burnett takes us inside the haunting beauty of Vancouver's empty landmarks. quite eerie, but also crazy to think that venues like this all around the world right now essentially look like that, almost like it's midnight where everybody's sleeping and, and no one's around. Yeah, very, very quiet. And uh, it's the same at uh, sports stadiums here and all around the world. But uh, Anita, the NFL is holding a virtual three-day draft right now. They're hoping their stadiums might be full in a few months. Coming up, how the league hopes to get players 
back on the gridiron in time for this season. This is a call out to any junior scavenger hunters. CBC Vancouver's digital scavenger hunt is taking place April 27th until May 1st. Kids of all ages can take part in this scavenger hunt from home. Participate every day for more chances to win a limited edition CBC Vancouver backpack full of prizes. Plus, you could score an invite to an exclusive online concert with Will Strode from Will's Jams. For more info, head to cbc.ca slash scavenger hunt. some sports news tonight. NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell is working from home this evening as he hosts a virtual league draft. We hope the draft will provide a break from everyday challenges. Let us dream of better days. Oh, come on, guys. Usually the three-day extravaganza rivals the hype of the Super Bowl. The NFL and other leagues are hoping to get back into play during the pandemic. As Jimmy Strashen explains, the only game in town these days is figuring out how they're going to do it. On April 29, 2015, a Major League Baseball game unlike any other took place. There was civil unrest in Baltimore and for security reasons, spectators were barred from the stadium. The Orioles played the White Sox with no one in the stands. 
It seems wrong. No roar of the crowd, none of the atmosphere that gives live sports its buzz. But what seems so wrong could be exactly the right prescription as professional sports plot a return. Mass gatherings is not in any of our near future. I think that is sort of pretty evident. So far, the model being floated by most professional leagues involves playing games in one city, so no travel. The NHL has talked about the idea of playing in multiple cities, but for all leagues, players and staff would be tested often and stay in hotels isolated from their families. We had a great day with this club yesterday. The PGA has proposed moving forward with four events without spectators, starting in June. We are going to need to be able to test players, caddies, and other constituents before we return, but we certainly, but we need to do so in a way that's not gonna take away from the critical need that we're currently facing. Other parts of the world have already started. In Taiwan, pro baseball games have returned. Instead of fans, cardboard cutouts and robots filled the stands. It's not just empty stadiums. All of these plans would require players to live in a bubble, perhaps for months. My wife is pregnant. Uh, what am I going to do when you know, she goes into labor? Am I going to have to quarantine for two weeks after I come back? Because, uh, you know, obviously I can't miss that, uh, you know, birth of our first child. Health officials stress that no matter how eager leagues are to get back in the game, minimizing the spread of the virus must be the priority before the roar of the crowd fills these stadiums again. Jamie Strashen, CBC News, Toronto. Well, a retired pharmacist in White Rock got the shock of his life recently when he checked his lottery ticket in the bathroom. Check Tibor Tisnati checked it five times, and yes, all six numbers matched. He went back to watching TV, and his wife uh, didn't say a word to her about it at all until the next day. To confess to her that I played the lottery, and uh, then after that, I told her I won the, the top prize, and she was just shocked and couldn't believe it. So we had to keep checking, checking for her a number <laughs> of times, and uh, that was it. And uh, subsequent to that, uh, we told the friends and relatives. Tesnati got his mega check on a hockey stick in a handover ceremony broadcast on Facebook in the interest, of course, of social distancing. He plans to help family and friends and go to Argentina and Uruguay, traveling first class when that travel ban is over, of course. Oh, that's fantastic. You know, I couldn't quite see the how much did, How much did he win? He won 16.5 million. 16.4 million. 16. Oh wow. Well, that should do. That should. Uh, that should uh, help a little bit. It'll be All a right. little enough. Congratulations I guess. to him. <laughs> exactly. Thanks for watching tonight. Dan is back uh, at 11 after the national.